The word legend is bandied around the poker world a little bit too frivolously these days, but with close to 35 million in lifetime earnings, eight World Series of Poker bracelets, and a WPT title to boot, I would say Eric Seidel deserves that title. In this episode of I Am High Stakes Poker, we learn how a young Seidel battled with dyslexia, his love of the arts and the media, and how his unique perspective on life has led to him competing in the highest stakes tournament in the world for the past three decades. How are you doing, Eric? Good. It's like being on David Letterman, isn't it? <laughs> it's just pretty much. <laughs> um, do you listen to music a lot when you're playing poker? I do uh, sometimes. Generally, I have I don't I, I have my headphones with me uh, in case I feel like listening to something or in case there's somebody at my table that's loud. Uh, but in general, I'm not listening. And you said uh, in case there's anyone on your table that's loud, so you you prefer more of a calmer atmosphere. Yeah, if there's if there's somebody talking a lot, and uh, I mean, it, sometimes. Sometimes the discussions, particularly in high rollers, are interesting, so I want my headphones off. But there are other times when you're at the table with somebody that's just blabbering on and on, and it's important to have some headphones on. I mean, today you're one of the most high-profile poker players in the world. I mean, one of the very few that actually transcend, transcends poker, I imagine. But going back right to the beginning, what were the type of things you thought you were going to be when you grew up, when you was a kid? Uh, when I was a young kid, I used to read a lot of crime books, and I had this idea that I might want to be a lawyer. And then as I got older, I thought maybe I would go into business, that I would be something along those lines. And I, I, I don't really think I had the sense then, as a teenager, how unqualified I was for anything in the business world or in any world. <laughs> was you a confident kid? No, not at all. No, I was very, I, when I was very young, I, I, well, I mean, I, I, I had convinced myself that I wasn't very bright. And uh, so I had a lot of a difficult time with that when I was younger. Where, where did that come from, do you think? I had dyslexia, so I had a difficult time at school. And uh, so it was just, it was, uh, it caused me a lot of trouble when I was, uh, you know, when I was younger. I just, I just felt like I didn't, uh, I didn't do well in school, and uh, I just was convinced that everyone around me was much smarter than I was. I, I had a similar thing, not not smarter, but I, when I was in school, I was uh, half Chinese, and everybody was just completely and utterly white, and I just remember growing up thinking like the whole world was against me because I was so different to everybody else. Is, is that the kind of feeling? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's probably fairly typical of, you know, kids who are teenagers have some issue or another. Not, you know, it's a very small percentage probably that are just, just that just wake up with confidence every day and really, uh, you know, so I, I don't know that it was that unusual what I was going through, but of course when we're going through it, <laughs> it's very difficult. It can mark you for life, I guess. Oh, yeah, I mean, it for certainly sure. did for me. It, it, it turned me into the person I am today. For sure, for sure. And, uh, and it was a struggle, you know, and then at, at some point, you know, I got to where I appreciated what, I'd, what I went through and, and, and the way things were for me because it motivated me to, to, to work harder and to, and to try and accomplish something because... Uh, because I, you know, I, I, I did feel this, uh, um, you know, when, when you lack confidence, uh, you know, you, you try and find, or I, I, you know, I tried to find some way to compensate. I mean, it's good that you, fa you, uh, you found the courage to do that, because I guess it can go one of two ways, can't it? You can beat yourself up and, and, and think that you're a failure and you're never going to amount to anything or you can do what you said you did and say right okay I'm going to prove these people wrong and I'm going to find something that I really excel yeah, at. Yeah and you have to be lucky too you have to you have to find I, w I was very fortunate to f uh, find the games world to find backgammon and uh, I was in the right place at the right time to develop skill at backgammon and then you know, with poker, I was lucky too. I was around at the right time and I was able to learn from the right people. You're in a, actually a, 
a very unique group because uh, I think it, the the founder of IKEA, Richard Branson, you know, there are several really um, high profile figures that went on to excel in their area of expertise who started out with dyslexia. Yeah, it's surprising that a, a, a really high percentage of CEOs and successful people had dyslexia when they started off. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, it is interesting. You, you, you wouldn't think that would happen because it is a handicap. Uh, but I guess people are used to compensating in different ways. When you say that you were lucky to be in the right place at the right time in terms of finding backgammon and finding poker, um, I think you've been a little bit humble there. I mean, it's not just that, is it? I mean, what else was it about you that, that enabled you in those early years to, to grow and to develop networking maybe, uh, technical skills? Well, I, mean, I, I had enthusiasm and, uh, and I really was in the right place at the right time because at the, at the time there was a, a big uh, renaissance of backgammon and uh, it happened to take place in the town that I lived in, in New York. Right. Uh, and Paul McGrill, uh, who really uh, uh, changed the game and revolutionized the game, uh, was around and, he was, and, he, and I became friendly with him. So uh, had I been anyplace else, I wouldn't have been able to develop those skills. Uh, so I literally was in the right place at the right time. And um, when you, you go back to those days when you're playing backgammon, I mean, was it unusual back then to play backgammon for money? I mean, for me now, even thinking about it, in modern times, it seems bizarre that you can play backgammon for money. I mean, what was yeah, it like? Yeah, I think it was unusual. And, and I think that, uh, you know, especially uh, my dad, you know, thought it was a, a really odd way to try and make a living. And he, he was a very traditional guy. Uh, so I don't know how comfortable he was with it, but, uh, but eventually, uh, I did do well at backgammon and then, uh, you know, at some point, uh, once I started playing poker, uh, I had enough success that, uh, that I think he was very happy about it. Was you one of those kids who felt the need to prove your parents wrong or one of them wrong, or was you, uh, one of those children who just wanted to, you know, Get them looking. I, I don't think I had a, a chip on my shoulder about proving anybody wrong. Uh, it was a ma it was just a matter of trying to survive and trying to get good at something. Um, it's it was also, and maybe it was just my perspective, or maybe if, maybe things would be different if I were starting now. But I I never had this sense that oh I'm going to develop into a great player. I could be like Stu Younger. Or I could be like Chip Reese. I, I never had that sense. I was just somebody who was interested in playing the game and hoping to make some money, doing it. But uh, but I didn't have the ambition uh, uh, that I could that I could be like these people. I thought I, they seemed like freaks to me. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Um, you, I read in your recent Poker News articles that you said that when you grew up, you was uh, like a shy, kind of awkward uh, kid. What is it? What are the type of things that bring out your your shyness? Because you can't. I assume you're not naturally always shy. So, like f now doing this interview, for example. I mean, you you seem fairly confident, and and, and I would assume like somebody who was shy would would not feel so confident or certainly wouldn't want to do it. I mean, are, are there certain things that you, you shy away from in life or uh, because of that? I was somewhat socially isolated uh, growing up and, and, uh, and I was very s s super shy around women. I was very, I never really, I just, I, you know, uh, so that was always an issue when, you know, when I was younger. It's a strange thing to talk about, but I just, uh, uh, I, I just think that, uh, and, and it's, it's kind of interesting because I think the poker world is filled with people who have some social awkwardness. And so there's a certain amount of comfort in all, in many of us being together. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, everybody together, not talking to each other. Yeah. I, I like yeah. it. I mean, I, I love it because of course, when I grew up, there was a, there was a very polarized view of of um, you know, like a stereotype. You're either a cool kid or you weren't a cool kid. Yeah. And, and shy wasn't cool. 
so nobody wanted to be shy. Like it was like some, it was like a, a bad thing. But when when you look at poker and you see a lot of people who have made it to the real like highest echelons of the game, who openly say, "Yeah, I'm shy." I mean, I think that's a really powerful, positive thing for people. I think cult, the culture has changed a lot too. Whereas. I would say maybe 30 years ago, if you wanted a job on Wall Street, part of your, the job interview would be, does he have a good personality? Does he, you know? And now I think they're much more aware that there are people who have a lot of social awkwardness uh, that would be huge assets on, you know, uh, at, at a firm. Uh, so it's less of a handicap in terms of finding a job. And it's more, it is more accepted. I think there are more people that kind of understand that it's that, that some people just don't have that when it when it comes to your life and you know what guides you through life are you do you uh pay any kind of conscious thought to values like uh, do you are you the type of person who sits down every year and goes right what are my core values and that kind of thing or or do those things just kind of pass you by i think those things are important I, one of the things that i like about uh this poker environment and some of the younger kids are very focused on okay you know I make a good living I've made a lot of money how can I contribute how can I give back and uh, with Dan Smith is leading that uh, but there are a lot of uh, players that are participating in what he's doing and really changing lives and putting up a significant amount of the earnings that they have in order to impact lives. And it, it's, uh, it, it's really, it's amazing to see how much they've done. And there's, there's no real way to understand uh, the impact that they have. Um, but when you think about the waves and waves of generations that are affected by the, uh, uh, by the causes that they're involved in, it's, it, 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 it's really amazing. It also is the perfect antidote to the problem of poker being a zero-sum game, I guess. It, yeah. Is that anything that ever used to bother you coming through the ranks? I think that as you make money, if you can find ways to help people, uh, I don't really feel that it's a zero-sum game in that sense. I, I, I do think that almost everyone I know is happy to contribute you know, and to try and find ways to make the world a better place. Uh, essentially, the people in poker, the, 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 uh, certainly at the top levels, are very socially conscious, I think. I remember speaking to Barry Greenstein in the Bahamas, and we were talking about service and effective altruism, and Barry was saying, as, as high profile as it is now and as wonderful it is, this service attitude has always been there within poker that he always remembers, you know you would always help each other out, you would always have a, you know, an eye on, on what was going on. Yeah, in the world. I think that's true. I do think that they've gotten better at it. Uh, as you look at uh, the causes that they're finding to contribute to, they're having a greater impact on the world and, and, and uh, per dollar, I think they're, they're being very effective at what they're doing. I know I read recently that you were having a little bit of a time out thinking about your options, whether or not, you know, poker was, you, you was going to put a lot of time in because, you know, the level that you're at and the level that you've consistently been at, you know, throughout your life, I, I assume it takes some work to maintain that. So I read that you was pondering about whether or not you should continue with it. Do you, do you spend a lot of time thinking about what is the purpose of Eric Seidel's life and and how poker fits into that and that kind of stuff. I have thought about that. Uh, and I love what I do. I love to play. I love to compete. I don't know what else I could do that would uh, both make me happy and also be allow me to contribute in other ways. Uh, I feel very fortunate to have found this world. So I don't know, I, I, I don't really see, I mean, I, I could see maybe finding some other careers that were satisfying. Um, at this point in my life, I'm, you know, I'm not sure how realistic that would be. I interviewed Stefan Sontime the other day and he, he was seemingly having a, 
a difficult time with with uh, getting his head around like being in poker more long term. And he was saying that for him, the 10, 12 hour grinds and, and the dissatisfaction of that time period uh, doesn't is nowhere near as, as uh, you know, the, the exhilarating highs don't match those lows. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that you're a family man, you know, you've got kids, you've got a wife and here you are in, in Jeju and you're traveling around the world playing in these things. Is, is how do you deal with that aspect of it as well? Uh, I, I feel lucky that I've been able to have a balance in my life because, uh, well, when my kids were growing up, uh, there weren't as many tournaments and I was staying home a lot in, in order to hang out with them and be part of their lives. Uh, and now uh, they're out of the house so I can travel as much as I want. Uh, and so I can just find, I love to, I, I do like to travel. I really like to spend time in New York when I can. Uh, so I'm trying to find the proper balance for myself. I don't want to overdo it and burn myself out. Uh, but it's something I enjoy doing too. It's, you know, it's, it's a thrill to show up and play these tournaments. So, you know, it's just a matter of finding the right balance. Do you still, or did you ever have poker goals? I remember speaking to you once about your phenomenal run in the Aussie Millions that time, like the, the first big multi-million streak. And you said to me, Leah, I wasn't even planning on playing that many, but I just had to keep going. I mean, right. are, you, are you a goals oriented person? Is there something particularly you want to cross off your list this year? I don't know that it's that realistic to have goals because it's going to be really at the effect of the randomness. Uh, so sure, I would love to win, you know, a major tournament, a couple of major tournaments. Uh, but um, I guess more my focus is on playing well and making good decisions. And then, you know, the cards will do what they do. <laughs> and what about outside of poker, though? Is there, what, what is it that you're not doing that you should be doing that so there's something stopping you from yeah. getting over that finishing line? Uh, I don't know. I, I, when I'm not playing poker, I, I do do what I want to do. So, I'll, you know, I, I love to hang out in New York. I like music, I like live music, and I like theater, and I like films, and I like reading, so I do what I want to do. Um, and uh, I can't really, I don't really feel like there's that much missing from that part of my life. What was it about Maria Konnikova that uh, attracted you then? Because I find that whole story fascinating. She just, she just rings you up, or she just gets all of you by email or whatever, and says, hey, Eric, how about you uh, teach me to play poker, like one of the best players in the world, and you're like, okay, let's go and have coffee and, and figure it out. What was it about her? That, that, well, uh, meeting her was interesting. I just thought, first of all, she writes for The New Yorker, which is very impressive. It's the, you know, one of the premier writing magazines in the, in, in the world, and, uh, and she certainly has charm. And uh, I, I thought about, well, I don't know what, what would this cost me in terms of competing. It didn't seem like it was going to cost me a lot in terms of my time. Uh, but would I be telling her anything that would cost me down the road? And I, I had some concerns about that. Uh, but I also thought, I don't know how much longer I'm playing the game. And so uh, it seemed like also an interesting challenge and it turned out also at our first meeting in talking to her and maybe just this is her skill as a reporter I don't know and her and her special charm but it felt like we were on the same wavelength in terms of thinking about the game and uh, so that helped a lot I felt like she's approaching it in the way that I would approach it and uh, I'm, I'm glad that I got involved with it I really enjoy rooting for her. It's, it's really fun. It's a great project. And I'm looking forward to the book. I think the book is going to be really great for, for the game. Yeah, I, I remember reading something about, you know, when, when you first got together, there was a lot of interviews around it. And, and, and part of what you were saying was, hang on, this is good for poker. I, I want to do this because it's good for poker. With someone of your standing, do you, do you, ever, do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel the pressure to do something to promote the game that's been so great for you? 
I feel like I would like to do what I can in terms of, of promoting it. Uh, I don't know that I'm the greatest, uh, you know, I think that somebody like Daniel or, or, uh, or Phil Helmuth are much better than I am uh, at, uh, at generating publicity and, 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 uh, and interest from people. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do my part when I can. I think I think that's that uh, that young boy and you coming out a little bit there, Eric. You know, I, I, no, that's I, true. I mean, I have to be realistic about that. I think that they have uh, they have a certain uh, they have a certain interest and charisma uh, that I don't necessarily have. But you still, for me, are a fascinating person because you're one of the very few people who have been able to consistently remain at the peak of the game I mean Daniel accepted I mean Phil doesn't play in these games you know there's very few of you you know you're you're a rare species and and for me that is interesting you know yeah it is for me too I, it's it's part of why I play I like to see I, I want to see how far I can take it and whether I can still compete and uh, it's challenging it's certainly I would say even the last year year and a half the game has changed a lot and uh so uh, it's a challenge to try and make the adjustments, and I don't know that I can hang in there. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll see. I, I, it wouldn't surprise me uh, if, I would ha if I have to drop back and, and uh, uh, give up high rollers, things like that. Do you feel underused in poker, or are you happy to just kind of like be there in the wings and occasionally doing an interview? Or, or do you think to yourself, well, you know, the World Series of Poker could use me more, the WPT could use me more. Do, do you ever think about that? I, I do. Sometimes I think that uh, I'm a little bit surprised at the focus of some of the, uh, some of the advertising content. And I feel like not just me, but uh, other players that are also uh, not, uh, you know, people who are also quiet. You know, somebody like Steve Chidwick. Uh, Steve Chidwick. He might be the best player in the world right now. Mm. Uh, and you just don't see people uh, promoting him or uh, a, a, as much as I'd like to see. I think there should be. It used to be people like Alan Cunningham, mm. who, you know, is a fantastic player and, uh, and a really interesting guy as well. And he's funny and he's, he's got a lot of personal charm. And uh, but I think he was overlooked, and I, I, I do think that the quieter players uh, don't seem to generate as much uh, interest. And I, I would like to see it. it. It's nice to see when you see Chidwick doing well, when you see David Peters doing well. Uh, I, I, it, I like seeing it, and I feel like I would like to see the poker world uh, respond a little bit more to what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, I echo those sentiments. Um, when it comes to strategy a little bit, not necessarily poker, I'll talk about poker in a little bit, but what, is, what are some of the key attributes you think that you've got in life that have enabled you to maintain this kind of steady kind of rate of, of being at the top like you you're still like three off the top of the all-time money list you're you're still playing in these top events what is it about your lifestyle that people can learn from and adopt into their own life to be successful in any kind of um, area of their life maybe i have a better uh perspective on the random nature of the game and so it takes a little bit less wear and tear for me mentally than it does for other people because I'm not looking at things like these things are happening to me or uh, having conversations like I'm so unlucky and I need to and uh, I have a different perspective on the randomness of the world and uh, less self-involvement in, in the results of, of, of what's happening. I think that's helpful. And, and that um, perspective, I imagine, is not just uh, poker. Like, that's how, that's one of your 
personality traits that gets you through life, right? Yeah, it's definitely not specific to poker. It is something that poker has helped me develop that perspective, uh, but uh, but it's not specific to poker for sure. And and you said that poker helps you to develop that perspective. What else has helped you to develop that perspective? And I ask that question because that's something that I struggle with. For example, you know, yeah. knowing it and trying to change the way that you wired. I find very difficult. So, did it just come naturally to you, or did you meditate? I mean, what what was it? Uh, it didn't come naturally to me. Meditation is a, is a way I think that maybe people can get there, uh, and, uh, and certainly people have had a lot of success with that. I'm not a huge meditator, but I do it a little bit. But I know a lot of people have had a lot of success with it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would say it's more from uh, reading. Uh, uh, you know, I, I just read a book called uh, the I think it's called The Self Illusion by Bruce Hood, that I think really uh, covers it pretty well, uh, and uh, I guess I, I mean I've done a fair amount of I've, you know I've, I've thought about this and looked at it for a long time and I've done you know some personal work and I don't know. How, how much does wisdom and experience play a part in that as well? I mean, was you like this when you was younger or are you just gradually, you know, it's becoming more of who you are as you mature? I definitely feel like it's something that you learn as you, or, you know, the, uh, I've learned as I've gotten older and, uh, and have gotten more experienced and have seen what the world is. I, 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 it's hard for me to imagine Having the having the burden of an oversized ego that I think a lot of people are have, have to deal with, and I think it's a it can be a real handicap, and it can cause a lot of stress. It does, so. Eric. <laughs> 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 um, I I worked on the railway for twenty years and. Throughout that entire time, I just kept thinking to myself, I can't wait to get to 55 so I can retire. I can't wait to get to 55. Uh, do you ever think about retirement? I think about it a lot, yeah. Uh, I don't know that at this point I'm ready to completely retire, uh, but I have thought about a lot about cutting back and, and, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm always trying to evaluate. I don't want to spend money on entry fees uh, if, I'm an, if I'm an underdog. And uh, so I'm always trying to figure out, you know, uh, trying not to be delusional uh, because I think we're all subject to that. Uh, so. so if I was to give you $20 million and skill and experience was not a factor whatsoever and said, go on, Eric, start the business of your dreams. I mean, what, what would you focus on? I think I would probably invest in films. <laughs> That'd probably be something I'd do. As a, in what in what capacity? Uh, I I I love movies, and uh, I, it would be interesting to work with creative people. Uh, so something like that, maybe start a, a little publishing house or something. Uh, I don't know. Do you write? I I don't really write very well. No, I'm I'm my brother is a writer and uh, very envious of his skills. And the other thing is, if, if I was to put you in charge of Bill Gates' foundation, what is the one pressing issue that, that you would focus on? I think I'd probably just hand it to Dan Smith. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say get on with that. <laughs> you know, he's done a lot more work into it. And, you know, uh, Liv has also done a lot of work. Uh, so they would be much better qualified to. But I also think that Bill Gates is doing a very good job himself. He seems very focused on important areas. I mean, he's, I would say, if you look back in 20, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, there may be nobody who's had a, as big an impact as he has mm. uh, with the money that he's used. He plays poker also. Does he? <laughs> Have you ever been in a game with him? I've never played with him, no. Um, but I always, I always like when anyone plays poker. So it, 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 uh, it's nice to know that he plays. Have you ever been starstruck? Have you ever played with somebody that you've been a little bit starstruck? I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very susceptible to being starstruck. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think I've gotten used to it either. You, know, you do, I, 
if you've played poker a lot, you certainly had the chance to play with a lot of celebrities. And uh, it's uh, uh, Neil Brennan, the comic, has, has a great line where he says that uh, being with a celebrity is like having a, a, a police car pull, pull up next to you. You just get very self-conscious about it. And uh, I, kinda, I, I like that. I, I feel like that's true. Do you ever feel, or have you ever felt yourself as a celebrity? No, uh, not in that way, but uh, I'm certainly, if you show up at a poker tournament, you, you know, I'll, I have to, you know, maybe there are people that might want to take a picture or something like that, but it's not, that's an entirely different thing. There was um, an article that went viral about five or six years ago. It was called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying by a palliative care nurse called Bronnie Ware, where she'd um, spoken to all these people on their deathbed and figured out what the things were that they, they would put right if they could go back in life. I'll probably ball this up now, I won't remember all five of them, but one of them was uh, to be happier, have more fun, um, to express themselves more was another one, not work so hard uh, was a third one. Um, remain closer to friends and, and, and bridge those gaps. I can't remember what the fifth was. Do you identify with any of those? Is there, is there anything that you think to yourself, I need to, I need to, I need to put a lid on this or fix this one or work on this one before? Uh, I, always, I always feel like I have social issues that, uh, that I, I should be a little bit better or, uh, and social situations. Uh, aside from that, the other thing is, I don't really feel like I'm overworked, or that uh, I don't know that I have those, you know, any of those other regrets. Uh, I feel fortunate to be able to make a living doing playing a game, <laughs> and and enjoying it and being challenged by it. You know, it's, it's you wake up and you have to play your best because you're playing against the best. It's a, it's, a really, it's a really interesting thing. I mean, it would be nice to be able to wake up and put a, a mediocre performance in and still do well, but uh, it's a different, you know, it, 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 the, the challenge is it keeps things interesting. The days of winning on your C game uh, have long gone, Eric. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's a problem uh, because you really have to be at peak performance every time you sit down um, and then it's also part of what makes it you know an exciting challenge too i you know i i like to sit and watch the best players in the world and see if i can try and figure out what they're doing and how to respond to it and on that note we'll end with um how does poker make you feel how does it make me feel <laughs> uh, I, it, I, I, I enjoy playing poker. I really, uh, I don't know. I feel like it's been a very fortunate to have a career to be able to put my kids through school uh, and do something that where I wake up every day and I'm interested in, in what I'm doing. Eric, thank you very much for your time. Okay. I really appreciate it. Sure.